Retirement means leaving the 9 to 5 grind behind you. But having nothing to fill those hours can lead to boredom. That's why retirement is hobby time. Funding for the Best Times is provided by Since 1988, the H.W. Durham Foundation has been focused on aging issues, providing grants to programs like the Best Times to enrich and improve the quality of life for our older citizens. The Best Times is the only monthly news magazine exclusively for the age 50 plus reader. Your copy is free at over 200 locations with important stories and news you don't want to miss. The Best Times is always the best. Trezevant, a life care community, a celebration of life. The responsible decision for your well-being now and in the long term. And being responsible has never been such a hoot. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. The dictionary defines hobby as an activity done regularly in one's leisure time for pleasure. When I was 10 years old, my hobby was building model airplanes and cars. Now, I haven't built one of these in nearly 50 years, but who knows, maybe I'll return to modeling as a hobby when I retire. Retirement gives us freedom from work, but not working can lead to boredom. That's why 73% of baby boomers responding to a survey said they expect to have a hobby or a special interest to occupy their time when they retire. What will you do? On tonight's show, we'll visit with five people and their hobbies to find out how it keeps their lives active and interesting. Come on, it's hobby time. I first met Vince Palazzola and his wife Barbara on the dance floor at the weekly meeting of the Memphis Bob Club. Both are avid dancers and they recapture a bit of their youth every Friday night. But Vince has another hobby. He's a collector. And it all started when he was a teenager working as an usher at the old Malco Theater, now the Orpheum, in downtown Memphis. I remember the first movie that I ushered was uh, Gunfight at the OK Corral. My fascination started with the Westerns. I mean, um, they taught us that right is always right, and that it's going to end up conquering at the end. And what tickled me is <clears throat> right at the end when the cavalry would come or the good guys would come, we actually would get up and clap. <laughs> now, more than half a lifetime later, those old B-movies that fascinated Vince as a teenager have become his hobby in retirement. I just like the old B-westerns, and when I saw one that was coming on, I decided that uh, I'm going to go buy me a VCR and start taping them. And the next thing I know, they just kept coming, so I kept taping. And then they would show a serial, and I got interested in them. And then they started selling them, and I got... The reason, though, that I really enjoy that is those are something that I can let my grandson and my nieces and nephews watch, and I don't have to worry about what they're going to see or hear. Because today, it's a whole new ball game out there, and, and I really enjoy it. Vince has over 8,000 movie titles in his collection. Most are the old B-movie westerns, from the 1930s and 40s. He also collects the classic serials and cartoon features that used to run before every movie at the theater. Collecting these films and watching them takes Vince back to his childhood and the memories of his favorite Western stars. My favorite was uh, Wild Bill Elliott. 
of course, I had to wear my guns backwards like he did. And uh, a lot of people don't know it, but Little Beaver was actually Robert Blake, Beretta. He was uh, Little Beaver in those. And uh, Lash LaRue was another favorite. Uh, Drango Kid, I, <laughs> I had, uh, yeah, there was no way I wouldn't watch Durango Kid if I had to go and borrow some bottles from the neighbors. <laughs> I had to go see that. In addition to collecting movies, Vince travels to film festivals to meet his childhood heroes and get an autograph. That's what's been fun is going to film festivals, get to see a lot of your old stars and um, they always have a booth and you can walk up and talk to them, uh, get their autograph. I've got a book in there that uh, I always take with me and when I see someone I'll go and find where they are in that book and I'll have them sign their name right by one of their movies. Vince shares his film collection with his fellow condo mates at Saturday morning movie time. I do the Back to the Past twice a month here in our condos, and I really enjoy that. We have a lot of fun. We laugh, uh, sit around eating popcorn and watching a lot of the uh, cereals. I always have one of those. And watching the old cars, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's just like going back in the past. You got to have something to make you want to get up every morning. And uh, I'm not going to be able to uh, dance like I like to do. So one of these days, I'm going to be 80 years old, and I've got something that I can always look back, you know, look forward to seeing. Plus, my wife and I, we watch movies uh, just about every night. We'll watch one. Instead of going to one, we, we'll um, pop the popcorn, and, and we'll watch a movie. And, and I really enjoy it. I'd like you to meet Ann Zielinski. Skydiving is not Ann's hobby. But after this jump, she was able to cross another item off her bucket list. Ann's hobbies are a little more down to earth and a little more in line with her British birthright. She knits. It, it's, it's mind erasing. <laughs> that's, what, that's what knitting is to you? It's mind erasing? Yes. Because it, um, I don't have to concentrate on it. I just, I see what my pattern is. I know where I have to go, and it, I, I do it. Anne's been knitting since she was six years old, but the impending birth of her grandson drew her attention to quilting. And I went to um, Walmart and, and saw a book, uh, and it had this very pretty, quilt on it and I thought oh I could do that wrong <laughs> so I took uh, and I did a very bad version of, of the quilt on the uh... Anne belongs to the Millington Cotton Patchers quilting group they meet regularly to show their recent completions and share ideas and techniques with each other quilting has become Anne's first love because I can be so creative with quilting I can, I can do things, I'll have an idea of a picture. I, I think deep down I wanted to be an artist, a, a, a true fine artist with paints and you know, just marvelous, you know, painting a chapel ceiling. <sighs> Number one, I was British and Brits don't do that. You had to be Italian, I believe, to do things like that. <laughs> My quilting, I have a tendency to do small, little, intricate things. And, and I like the fact that people who don't quilt will say, whoa, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and then I say, oh, it's really easy. Oh, yeah, for you. No, it really is. But they don't believe me, so that's good that they don't believe me, but it truly is quite easy. <laughs> easy or not, Anne and her friends produce some beautiful work. But Anne has another hobby, quite different from quilting, yet just as creatively satisfying. I've been writing all my life. Uh, my father wrote, 
My uncle was editor of the uh, Tatler and Bystander in London. I'm destined to write. Whether, whether I write and become famous is, isn't, isn't important to me. I don't have to be published. That's not important. I have things I want to say. And as long as it pleases my small circle, that's important. This is the monthly meeting of the Davies Plantation Writers Group, or Chapter One, as they like to call themselves. Anne and the other members share their most recent literary works with one another and challenge themselves with writing assignments. It's fun to see what different people do with the same subject matter. Anne has no desire or ambition to become a published author or to write pieces much longer than the 1,500 words she usually pens. To do more would turn a creative hobby into the drudgery of work. And that might take away the great satisfaction that Anne gets from both writing and quilting. A satisfaction when, when someone else says, I like that. Yeah, that, it's, a, it's an ego trip in reality. And we all have an ego. And we all have to have that ego fed in one, one way or another. My, my mission in life is to learn everything that I can about interesting things and interesting people. I think my hobbies picked me to a lot Dr. Jeff of Justice is a retired orthopedic surgeon whose boyhood love for woodworking has become his post-work passion. And actually, this is the way the old uh, when I was about 10 years old, my uncle gave me a jigsaw. Didn't have a motor, so I hooked up a, a lawnmower motor, gasoline motor to it. And we had a little uh, shop. It was a five by eight foot little wooden building that we had put together. And I set my jigsaw up in that and started the gasoline motor and about asphyxiated myself in there while I was cutting little things out of the jigsaw. That's what really got me started, I suppose. Jeff and his wife moved to Oxford, Mississippi and built their retirement dream home, which includes this huge, well-equipped wood shop. In here, Dr. Justice finds the same creative outlet that he experienced in the operating room, rebuilding bones and bringing a sense of order out of chaos. Taking something organic, uh, a piece of wood that's uh, rather plain and making something nice out of it, and uh, I, I get a lot of uh, 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 satisfaction with creating something like that, making something new out of something chaotic you might say. The problem I see with many doctors is that they do not develop another hobby or another outlet for their creativity while they're practicing. And then when they retire, they're at, at a loss, you might say. And I've been very fortunate in having this for so many years before I became a doctor and it just continued after that. A quick tour through the justice's home reveals the extent of Jeff's creative expertise at furniture building. Every room in the house contains pieces that he has created from bare wood and an idea. I love early American or period furniture. When I design, say, a piece of furniture, um, I may start with some vague concept and, and then I, I start putting it in paper on, down on paper to get an idea about proportion and um, once I start, I, I never complete the plans on paper. <laughs> I always have other ideas that develop as I'm building something. And, then you'll have and um, to me, that's part of the fun is, is um, uh, seeing it in the whole and then saying, well, if I add this or if I uh, do a little decorative carving here or there, it's going to increase the appearance of the uh, beauty of it. If you drive down to the local airport in Oxford, you'll see Jeff's 
other hobby. He's been a pilot for years, but back in 1987, he decided to construct a kit-built airplane. It's interesting, this is a metal airplane, and although I love wood, woodworking, it gives me a little bit of a break from that. A lot of times I'll glue something up and, and it'll have to sit for 24 hours before I can do anything else to it, so I'll use that opportunity to go to the airport, which is very close, and easy to get to here. And I get a lot of fun out of metal work also. It's, it's more precise and um, a little cleaner than woodworking. You don't breathe sawdust when you're working on metal. After 23 years of construction, Jeff's airplane will take flight later this year. It will be satisfying to fly his creation, just as it is satisfying to use wood, glue, and nails to create beautiful, functional furniture. And that is the ultimate purpose of a hobby. I've seen people who uh, finally find something that they can put their heart into, photography, for example. Uh, I think you just have to decide that you're not going to sit around and watch TV or play cards all the time or play golf all the time. I don't play golf, so I shouldn't criticize anybody that does. <laughs> but, uh, I think uh, having something that allows you to, again, create something, I think is important. You probably recognize this guy. Jim Eichner has appeared on your television screen, often with me alongside him, asking you to become a member of WKNO. Jim has been a lover of art since the second grade in Shreveport, Louisiana. And I sat next to this uh, youngster who was a prodigy in art. His name was Donnie. Donnie and I had uh, uh, being movie buffs in common, so we became friends, went to the movies a lot, and I would be astounded at the work that he would do with pencil, paper, then the first time he did watercolor, it took my breath away. I thought, how can this kid do this? It was just wonderful. I mean, pictures just sprang from a page when he started on it. And I'd go to his home and he'd show some things that he had done, and I said, I've got to do this. One of these days, I've got to do this. But of course, he was so good, I was intimidated to really try it then, but I said, one day, that day arrived for Jim a few years ago when he took a watercolor class from Fred Rawlinson. He made you see things. He did marvelous things like uh, if there was one artistic work of one of the students that was not too distinguished, he would take that work and, and he would take some pieces of paper and form a square or a frame around one little corner of the work that was just a really nice piece. He says, look at this. That's gorgeous. That's wonderful. The rest of it doesn't carry out the promise that's here. Now, if you can get that going, that's fine. And let's sit there. To be able to see in something that's there or be able to envision something that's not, this was Fred's secret. This is what he taught you. And then to watch his technique of wet on wet watercolor, wet a piece of paper, put some pigment on, let it see what happened, uh, to see what happens to it, was exciting. So that's, that's how I started. Painting has made Jim see life and the world around him in a different way. It's a very positive quest for beauty, and if you look for it, you can find it. They say beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Well, I think in many respects that is. Something that looks to be very prosaic, you can go up close to it and look and say, look at that pattern. You know, it's, uh, it's a, a little quest that it sends you on, a positive quest, and I think that's uplifting. With, with watercolor, uh, I mean, the die is cast. When you, when you wet that uh, paper and you put that pigment on and get the most out of it that you can in a short period while it's drying, that's it. Uh, so when I see that in the time allotted, I got something I liked, that's good. It's not a forgiving medium. You, you know, you can't really correct watercolor that much. You just get another piece of paper and start over. And you can't be too intimidated about going through a lot of paper either. It's getting in mind generally what I want to do and then wetting the paper, putting the pigment on, see where it runs. You can pick it up and let it run around a little bit, you know, and uh, uh, let, the, let the pigment begin to tell you where you want to go. Jim's artwork hangs throughout his house, 
And although he still considers himself a learner, his paintings have sold at several auctions, including our own Gallery 10. Jim calls himself an art junkie, and the discipline of watercolor fills his creative need. I think that's one of the only ways you can really feed your spirit with stuff that you can do. Uh, there's such excitement. Um, I, I have a little mantra that I repeat most mornings uh, that uh, is, is a, uh, an acronym, GLAD. Uh, to wake up grateful, uh, to find some way that day to, to love, to show love, to treat life like an adventure, the G-L-A-D, and the, the fourth is the t most difficult for me, and that's discipline. You do all this, but you've got to have some discipline with it. And this motivates me and keeps me going, and it's exciting to say there is no acceptable alternative to viewing this day as an adventure. Most hobbies don't have a dress code, but since Dick Shaw's Midtown backyard is filled with eight beehives and over 250,000 honeybees, a protective bee suit isn't a bad idea. Dick has been a beekeeper for eight years, having come into the hobby through the back door of home brewing and winemaking. I'd always wanted to make wine, so I migrated to making mead, which is honey wine buying honey from local beekeeper and I said, well you know I could change the recipe a little bit instead of starting with honey I could start with bees. Dick is a member of the Memphis Area Beekeeping Association a group of professionals and amateurs who share their love and knowledge of bees. He jump-started his hobby with their short course on beekeeping that meant learning about the society of bees. The drone which is the male bee doesn't have much to do other than being a daddy. Uh, the worker bees, which are females, with their ovaries are undeveloped uh, because they didn't get fed that royal jelly. Uh, and the queen who was. Those are basically the three casts, if you might call it. Uh, usually about 10% of a hive might be drones during the summer. Honeybees are a vital part of the human food chain because they pollinate as much as 30% of the food that we eat. And in the last 50 years, the U.S. has lost half of its honeybee population. I've heard you've heard the term colony collapse disorder, or CCD, which is a very peculiar uh, situation where you find just a few bees and a queen and a little bit of brood, and most of the bees are gone, and they don't know why yet. They've got some high-powered people working on that, and they say they might be coming up with some answers shortly. As you watch Dick in amongst the bees, I know the question you're asking, and yes, Dick has been stung by the bees. The first time it happened, he turned red and went to the doctor. So when I finally talked to an allergist about it, he said, oh, I think you're at risk. You maybe should, you know, quit doing this. Well, I sold my hives all but one. And then I decided, no, I like it too much. I'll take my chances. Now Dick takes precautions, like the bee suit and the smoker. Plus, he's on a once a month bee venom therapy, which controls the allergic reaction. Dick is hooked on beekeeping. I think that getting the honey makes the, the difference in that, you know, you're actually having a product that you got. But I find that, you know, reading about bees and if you want to know everything there is to know in the world, study bees, because it just branches out every which way. Biology, uh, you know, the taxonomy of animals, or whatever, whatever you have. Dick harvests the honey only about once a year. He dreams of moving to a more rural location to give the bees rich foraging territory. But he knows that the value of his bees isn't measured in honey alone. My nature is I will always be occupied, just my nature. I, I cannot sit in a rocking chair on a, full, and on a porch and sip tea. It's just not me, you know. And I probably have, you know, half a dozen hobbies going at any one time. But uh, I think for the person who is just getting retired and kind of in shock, you know, well, here I'm retired, I've been working and doing this stuff, and I don't know what to do now. I mean, 
definitely do something. Get a hobby. If you don't like it, get a different one. You're bound to find something you like. Want more information about life after 50? Go to our website, wkno.org slash best times. And while you're online, click over to Next Avenue, PBS's website where grown-ups keep growing. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Hardaway. Good night. Funding for the best times is provided by Trezevant, a life care community, a celebration of life. The responsible decision for your well-being now and in the long term. And being responsible has never been such a hoot. TrezevantManor.org The Best Times is the only monthly news magazine exclusively for the age 50 plus reader. Your copy is free at over 200 locations with important stories and news you don't want to miss. The Best Times is always the best. Since 1988, the H.W. Durham Foundation has been focused on aging issues, providing grants to programs like The Best Times to enrich and improve the quality of life for our older citizens.